Let's talk about Vim. So, for this work, um, and this is kind of just an interesting aside that's worth discussing. Um, it's not something I need you to memorize or make notes on necessarily, um, but it is a good conversation to have, especially as we work towards our research investigation, um, which will be on this topic, don't forget. Um, so your research investigation will be on quantum and light, uh, not quantum matter, I don't think. We're just focusing on quantum light for that research investigation. So there's a couple of phenomenon you can investigate, and one of them is Veen's discoveries. Um, namely, and uh, <laughs> this can get a little bit contentious, but um, does anyone here, I'm sure you guys are, are very embedded in the history of climate change, okay? You would have grown up hearing about uh, maybe global warming and all that sort of stuff, and maybe you've heard people make arguments against global warming, saying, no, it's not, the world isn't warming, in some places it's getting colder, and it depends whether you're in the atmosphere or the surface of the water or down deep in the oceans or on land, it's more complicated than that, stuff like that. Um, one of the fundamental principles of global warming is around greenhouse gas emissions, and this is why there's currently a push to get away from coal, um, as a fuel source and move to renewable sources. And if you've ever met anyone in your life um, who thinks, no, burn more coal, it's fine. CO2, the trees need it, they absorb it, that sort of stuff. Um, here's the very simple bit of science that proves that argument wrong. And it, it, it's absolutely accepted science, and this is why the scientific community is at wit's end with the whole argument against climate change and global warming. Um, when you emit carbon dioxide, okay, and a bunch of other greenhouse gases, including um, methane and, and several others, which are produced naturally all the time, okay, but if you increase the amount of them being produced, um, they often float. Floating is not a big deal in itself. It means they go up into the atmosphere and they end up quite high up in the atmosphere. Now, the energy coming from the sun, if we bring that graph up, the energy coming from the sun is, our sun is actually peaking at green, um, and it's a trick of biology that we see it as more yellow. We don't see sort of greens very well or something like that. I, I don't know the biology of it, but I ask your biology teacher. Um, but our eyes aren't very good at receiving the green or the blue or something like that. So we see the sun is quite yellow, um, but it actually peaks about that green wavelength there, okay? The energy coming from that, the light coming from that, or the electromagnetic radiation to be more specific, because it's not just visible light, it's also um, quite a lot of, or a reasonable amount of ultraviolet, a um, little bit of x-ray, uh, very, very, very tiny amount of gamma, um, and all the radio waves and all the other stuff as well. It's mostly pretty high energy, um, oscillates at a pretty high frequency. And it does actually get uh, through our atmosphere pretty well. It doesn't uh, refract or reflect. So it doesn't bounce off our atmosphere. It can penetrate, as Alex was sort of indicating before, it can penetrate quite easily into our atmosphere. Now, when it gets into our atmosphere, um, obviously it gets absorbed by something at some point, all right? When it comes from the sun and hits our atmosphere, some of it might be reflected, a lot of it gets absorbed. When it is absorbed and then re-emitted, the energy of the light that is re-emitted is different because the object absorbing it is not going to increase in temperature up to the temperature of a sun just because it's been heated by the sun's light, right? Um, I'm sure you've felt the heat of the sun on a hot day. It doesn't make you, uh, you know, 7,000 Kelvin boiling, fusing hydrogen, right? It doesn't make you that hot, yeah? You might heat up a little bit, but you're probably still emitting mostly infrared light. Now, the wavelength of infrared light just so happens to be almost perfectly absorbed by greenhouse gases. Now, that's not a problem, once again, in and of itself. It means off the surface of our Earth, all of the uh, energy, all of our thermal radiation is going up, back out, hopefully back out of our atmosphere, some of it. We want to lose some of that thermal energy. Um, but because it's coming out at a wavelength that is absorbed by carbon dioxide and absorbed by methane gas and a lot of other greenhouse gases, it gets absorbed before it exits our atmosphere, okay? Now that's fine because then that's going to be readmitted re as well, re-emitted as well. But the problem is it's all heading out, it gets absorbed and re-emitted in all directions. And this is the fundamental problem, right? When it is all trying to leave our atmosphere and it all gets absorbed and it all gets re-emitted in all directions, then only half of it is going away from us and the other half comes back down. 
and you get this 100% comes in, right? Maybe 10% gets lost, right? So 90% hits us. 80% leaves us, 10% ends up being absorbed and held by stores of heat and stuff. Um, so 80% leaves, gets reabsorbed, right? Maybe 10% escapes, so 70% gets absorbed, okay? That 70%, of that 70%, half of it comes straight back down. And the other half might make it out, but it'll probably encounter more greenhouse gases and come back and be reabsorbed. So instead of ending up escaping our atmosphere, heat gets trapped. And that's exactly what happened on Venus. Venus is now a hot flaming ball of death. Um, I think it has almost the exact same gravity of our, as us. I can't remember whether it's slightly lighter, actually. Does yeah, anyone know? Yeah, yeah, it would be. It would have been beautiful. It would have been like Earth a long time ago. There's, there's lots of theories that it probably did have uh, water, um, but it had a runaway greenhouse effect and essentially trapped all its heat. And now any heat that comes in gets reabsorbed. It's at a point of equilibrium now where it's so hot that the energy it releases doesn't get trapped in its atmosphere as badly. So it's not continually getting hotter. Um, but now you would die if you went there. In fact, we tried to send a probe there and I think it made it like 10 kilometers into the atmosphere and then crushed. On the surface, did it make it to the surface? And then it got entirely crushed and melted and destroyed. It looks like hell. It, yeah, it literally is hell on, Earth, on Venus. Yeah. So, we don't want that to happen to Earth, which is why we do need to reduce greenhouse uh, gas use. And if you get a research question on that, that's something you could consider looking into further. Uh, your textbook has a whole chapter on it, in fact. Let me get rid of this. I don't want to leave marks all over this textbook, even digitally. <clears throat> your textbook has a whole chapter on it, um, which you can investigate if you are interested. Okay, let's get into the meat of the potatoes. Here's your new heading, guys.
All right, I'll give you a minute to copy that down, and then we'll have a quick chat about that. If unpaused. So, um, Planck looks at all these problems going on, um, and again, in particular, the ultraviolet catastrophe, catastrophe at the time was a pretty big deal, but he was more focused on um, something else, um, another uh, mathematical issue with the uh, experimental results from black body radiation. And he had no evidence to support this, but he said, hey, maybe light does actually come in packets. Because remember, they did used to think that it was corpuscles, right? Little balls of light, okay? He said, maybe it has wave-like properties, but it can come in discrete packets. It cannot just have any radiation uh, amount of energy that it wants. It actually has to have um, sort of a one or a two in energy, okay? It can't be 1.5. That's the idea of continuous versus discrete, right? Uh, discrete numbers are integers, one, two, three. Continuous numbers are like your height, we could say, is a continuous variable. It's any, any sort of number we put to it. We could say you're 186.349217 centimeters tall, okay? Um, so he just sort of spits this out, and he's like, it, it sort of works. It solves the ultraviolet catastrophe and the other issues. Um, and he actually comes up with a number. His number was not the number that ended up being sort of accepted, but he came up with a number for it, and it was fairly accurate. Why has that come up? The heck? I guess I need a password. Um, lesson learned. <laughs> How can two people mirror to me at once? <laughs> All right, lesson learned. I will put a password on that, I guess. Um, <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, he estimated a value from the data. Um, someone else ended up estimating a, a value that was more accurate. Um, but we now call it Planck's constant. Um, it wasn't actually his. Now, this formula, again, is in your formula and data book, and Planck's constant is in your formula and data book as well. Can someone tell me Planck's constant? Because it's an incredible number. 10 to the power of? Close, close. Negative 34. Now, what that means is you have to divide by 10 34 times. That means there's like 33 zeros before you start saying 626 joules. Okay, remember this is energy, so the unit is joules. It is incredibly small, which is why we don't notice that it's discrete, but it turns out it is. Now, you guys actually know why this happens now. They didn't at the time. They had no idea what was causing this. You now know why things that emit electromagnetic radiation emit them in very specific quanta of energy. Anyone tell me what it is? You might, you might not have actually covered this, but you, you have the, the preconceived knowledge, you have the models you need to predict what causes this phenomenon. Why light does only ever come out with a set amount of energy. Why it can't have half of the energy of one other light particle. Why does it have to have this much energy, then this much energy? Because what? Well, here's a question. How is light emitted? Where does it come from? When the sun emits that light, what is actually making the light? Heat? Heat is a type of light. It's infrared radiation. It's just electromagnetic radiation. So hydrogen and hydrogen fuse together to make helium. Yeah, you're onto something here. Hydrogen and hydrogen fuse together to make helium. But hang on, no energy can ever be created or destroyed, right? So where does the light come from? Where was it before? Mass defect. So this is, yep, yeah, this is one idea. Yes, there is an amount of energy in mass defect. This slightly different though. We're looking for something a little bit different. Don't think physics. 
think chemistry. What? I can't hear you, Brendan. I don't know whether anyone's ever taught you this or told you this. Um, who knows what the Bohr model is? Remember the Bohr model? So here's helium, right? Helium has two electrons in its first energy level. Okay. Was, did you predict energy levels was the thing? So remember electron shells, right? We call them energy levels. So here, n equals 1. There's two electrons in n equals 1, the first energy level. That's for helium in the ground state. Now the reality is, when hydrogen and hydrogen react, they're moving very fast, there's kinetic energy involved, okay? Um, they have a bit of thermal energy, and what, what, what thermal energy is, is a mystery for you guys for now, but they have some other internal energy, and when they collide and make helium, there is a mass defect, which is a difference in energy. The way that energy is accommodated is because helium, after those crazy reactions, has no electrons in its innermost shell. It probably gets electrons in its outer shells. Think about it this way. When you girls were doing your experiment spinning that thing, if you spin harder, it pulls out harder, yeah? The faster you move that, the further away from you it wants to be. It's the same with electrons. When they have more energy, they are forced out to outer shells. It's almost like they have some vibrational energy and they move outwards, okay? Um, in reality, what that energy looks like is completely arbitrary. We don't know. There's no point discussing it. But they seem to move into other electron configurations when they have more energy. And after a while, they decay back to their ground state. And every time they jump, they emit a photon of light. And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we get into um, quantum mechanics for matter. Um, but essentially, that is why light must have a set amount of energy. And I don't need you to know that right now. Um, again, we are going to do that in detail in a second. But, but that's it. Because there are energy levels or specific ways in which atoms have to be structured, when the electrons change their energy levels, they emit set amounts of energy. Okay? Now, again, the energy that they emit is a very, very small amount of energy per photon. Okay? So we're going to introduce a new unit. You get it? I did see that. That was cruel, but also kind of funny. No, it was, cr it was cruel. Very inappropriate. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Uh, do you want to copy that down? No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Um, copy down the point that uh, the unit for energy is joules. However, for a typical photon, the energy is very small, maybe you could say. Or you could just say, you could say by 10, blah, 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 by 10 to the negative something joules. You could just do this instead. <laughs> so we have a better unit. Why was that a big click for you? Have you had to use that before? Yeah. 
No, you can just do the scientific notation. Times 10 to the negative 30 joules. I'm going to try and squeeze one last thing on there. Um, from memory, this is given on your formula in dot books. Okay. One electron volt. One point six zero. Zero is important. Mm -hmm. By ten to the negative nineteen. Ten to the negative nineteen. Do you mean, or do you mean one point six or the EV? It's come up for us before. I'm pretty sure. Um, probably in our EM unit. I think we probably mentioned the electron volt at some point. Um, now again, that's given in your formula and data book. Just to be clear, that is the number one, and then lowercase e, capital V. Yeah, that's not IEV or anything weird. Mosquito? You get it? Good. Some weird moment's gonna be caught on this recording. Oh <laughs> uh, well. I think I emailed your parents recently about the recordings actually. They're like, hey. No, 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 everyone's. Everyone's, because it came up at um, parent teacher interviews. And one of the parents was like, I didn't even know. Yeah, clearly. All right, we've got 23 minutes. In that time, I want to get through uh, one example and ask you guys to do a few questions, okay? So I'll write that example now. I will leave my notes up. Oh, did you want to discuss this first? Yeah? Yeah, that's, it's called lunchtime. I'll try and wrap it up early. We'll see. Uh, give me a second. What is happening? Whoa. I did break it. Holy heck. Quantum theory and light, please. Stand by. In my example. What page is this? Page 312, remember that guys, oops. Sorry, there's your notes again. What did I say the page was, 312? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Jennifer. I don't know whether the recording's catching this, but I am not going to respond because it will catch what I say. All right. Um, so electron volts, just another unit for energy. Um, they are equivalent to joules by a certain amount. It's just so that we can deal with realistic numbers. It's essentially like micrometers. You know, we've been using um, micrometers for uh, wavelengths and stuff like that. It's essentially just a, a different type of unit. Now, this question, I want you all to notice a connection here. And this is where things get a little bit weird. Straight away, I'm giving you an example where it's slightly more complicated. We're not just plugging numbers into the formula. You guys get that type of question, right? I've got E equals HF there. If I just gave you a frequency, you could tell me the energy of the light just by multiplying by Planck's constant, yeah? Too easy, I don't care about that. Here's what I want you to recognize. The rules of electromagnetic radiation do still apply. Okay, so even though Planck's proposal in many ways um, said there was something wrong with uh, the electromagnetic theory for light, um, actually all it was was a slight change, that constant value to make sure that we had a discrete amount of light. And so we can still use our regular uh, wave theory to calculate things about light here. So we are asked to calculate the energy, E, which we know is equal to HF, but we're given for a quantum of violet light, which has a wavelength, lambda, of 450 nanometers. And do we remember what nanometers is? 10 to the negative nine, isn't it? which is 4.5, if I wanted to divide that by two tens, I would multiply that by two tens, so that would be 10 to the negative seven meters. I don't know if that's helpful, we might not need to have done that conversion, but good to get in the habit of always getting our SI units straight away. Now, we're given a wavelength here. We don't need a wavelength. For the energy of a quanta or a photon, we need frequency. Why is that not a problem whatsoever? Cody? So we're given a wavelength. We need a frequency. See if there's anything in your formula and data book or anything you remember from um, our wave unit back in unit two. Say it nice and loud. Uh, not quite. That doesn't exactly help us. Say that again, Max. Something equals V equals velocity of a wave is equal to F over lambda or F lambda? F lambda, sorry. Okay, um, that gives us a relationship between F and lambda, but we don't know the velocity. Of course we do. It's the speed of light. C equals F times lambda. Now that connection there is super critical, that connection between wave theory and light theory, even when we're doing quantum light theory, uh, is important that you guys recognize as well. Yes, yes, always speed of light in a vacuum. We're not gonna be asking you guys to deal with. So light speeds up when it changes medium. Yeah, so it will return to the speed of light, yep. Okay, so um, we can do some rearranging here. We know C, let's use it to find frequency. We wanna know frequency, so frequency will equal C divided by lambda. Be careful with your rearranging, make sure you don't make any silly mistakes by skipping steps or anything. Um, that gives us a way to find E, because we know wavelengths, so E is equal to, um, H times F, where F is C on lambda. H and C are constants. Divide them by 4.5 by 10 to the negative 7, or 450 by 10 to the negative 9, either or. 
Um, and you're good. Question? So you've got your wavelength here, Hannah. So you're just going to multiply h, which is a constant, 6.26 by 10 to the negative 34. And c, which is a constant, 3 by 10 to the power of 8 feet of light. Multiply them together and then divide by wavelength. What are we getting? 6.26 by 10 to the negative 34 times by 10 to the power of 8. So you're going to end up at 10 to the negative 26. You divide by 10 to the negative 7. So you're going to end up with 10 to the negative 19. 10 to the negative 18 because you'll be in the hundreds. Anyone got an answer around that? Six point two six. Oh yeah, six point six two six. Did you get it, Kobe? Co huh? No. Has anyone done it for me? You got it. Four point four two times ten to the negative nineteen. That sounds about right. Um, four point four two, four point four two SI units. Are we happy? Ah, uh, sorry, not SI units. Significant figures. Yep, cool. Um, remember, be careful when you're doing the by ten to the negative nineteens and whatever. If you gave that to me as four hundred and forty-two by ten to the negative times by a hundred instead of negative twenty-one. Right. If you gave it to me as 442 by 10 to the negative 21, you have lost SI units. You are less correct if you say this. They are equal, but you are not. Oh, actually, no, it's still three. Sorry, if it was, if it was a zero, if it was a zero, for example, just to make a point, because this comes up a lot. If it was a zero and you gave me your answer like that, um, you would have lost significant figures by not having that zero after the decimal place. You could put in brackets three significant figures. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I thought that was a good time to make that point, but actually it was three significant figures either way. For that example. Okay. Um, what? 4.42 by 10 to the negative 19 watts. Hmm? Joules. Did you get an answer that disagrees, Hannah? No. Cool. Um, we also want an answer in EVs. We are asked for joules and EVs, so let's convert to EV. So convert to EV. Now, unit conversion, no matter what, will always break your brains, so take your time and do this properly. If one joule equals 1.60 by 10 to the negative 19 joules, what does 4.42 by 10 to the negative 19 joules become. Sorry, one EV, sorry, one EV. What did I do? One EV equals. If 1.6 by 10 to the negative 19 joules equals 1 EV, what does 4.42 by 10 to the negative 19 joules equal? You need to know what to multiply both sides by to convert, which means do division first. Do it backwards. I want to know, I want to multiply 1.6 by something to give me 4.42. Right, remember your formula triangles? Have you guys done this with your math teachers ever? No. Do your math teachers do formula triangles? No. Not trigonometry, formula triangles. That's not meant to be a curve, hang on. Yeah, you can do unit cancels, whatever works. Um, so if you have a formula triangle, if you wanna know what to multiply 1.6 by to get 4.42, 
you can do 4.42 divided by 1.6. And it tells you what that factor is that you need to multiply by. But obviously don't just type in four, well, I guess you can just type in 4.42 divided by 1.6 because it's all by 10 to the negative 19, so. Yeah, the other way to do it, like Max said, would be 4.42. Actually, this is how I originally taught you, isn't it? Canceling units like this. Joules, if E equals that, and the conversion factor is 1 EV per every 1.6 by 10 to the negative 19 joules, you multiply by that conversion factor. Times 10 to the negative 19 and joules will cancel out. Times 10 to the negative 19 and joules will cancel out. You're left with 4.42 EV. Oh, sorry. 4.42 EV divided by 1.6. That'll be, what do you get? Say that again, Sam. Much nicer number, yeah. That's a bit of a messy response, sorry. But hopefully that made sense. Any questions about that? Is that all right? I'll give you, we've got 10 minutes to lunch. I'll give you one problem to try and work through yourselves just to check that you can do it on your own. I will give you, repeat for green light. Nice and simple. I cut off the end of four, sorry. Like it never happened. I'll call this a CFU, little check for understanding. Yep. Is what what? Um, do it with three. Probably a bit lazy of them. No, he's asking about the question. 500. 500 nanometers, I think he's asking. Oh! 